All right, let's jump right into it. We are talking about the mode of baptism. That is, what way or what method is acceptable, or are there several methods that are acceptable when it comes to the word or the way in which, rather, we are baptized into Jesus Christ? Such an important step. Uh, in fact, it is one of some five or six steps of salvation, adding on, of course, remaining faithful till death. But the point in which you're baptized into Jesus Christ is the point in which your blood, or the blood of Jesus, washes away your sin, and you are a child of God. So we want to make sure we're doing that correctly, of course. And so, what is the proper mode? To begin with, we're going to notice that uh, baptism, the word, is a transliteration. A transliteration. Now, somebody tell me why this won't click over. Somebody tell me what a transliteration is. I'll just do it manually. What's the difference between a translation and a transliteration? Yes. You're not supposed to use the word in the definition, though. Trans now, what other word would you use, though, right? You're exactly right. Exactly. It's, it's literally, they just take the Greek word, like in this case, uh, baptizo, and they just change it to baptism. They kind of just spell it in an English way, for lack of a better way to put it, and just turn it into an English term. Baptism is, is not a real word, really. It's just made up. It's a transliteration from the word baptizo, which is the Greek word from which it's translated, or bapto, or baptisma, all the different forms, uh, verbs, nouns of that, uh, various... Uh, a word. And so baptism is a transliteration, not a translation. Why that is significant is that the word baptism does not tell you what the word actually is. We have some examples I have here on your worksheet. Letter A there. For example, deacon. Deacon is transliterated from diakonos. Okay? Deacon is transliterated from diakonos. Deacon is a made-up word. It's a transliteration. It's not an actual uh, word that we've had in the English language. It's just transliterated from that diakonos, right? Just a, a fancy Greek term. But it literally means a servant. If you translate the word diakonos, you're going to write the word servant. That's the translation. That's what it means. Deacon is just an English form of the Greek word, literally. And in fact, look at Romans 16 and verse 1. Understanding the difference between a transliteration and a translation really helps to uh, clarify lots of controversial subjects uh, really in the Bible, knowing just a little bit of Greek. Look at Romans 16 and verse 1, for example. Someone read Romans 16 and verse 1 for us when you get there. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church which is at Centria. Excellent. The word there for servant is the word for deacon that we're just talking about. The word there is uh, translated. Diakonos is translated in this passage to servant. Some versions, you'll actually see the word deacon there. And so many would take this passage and say, women can be what? Deacons. If you've ever heard that argument before, this is their proof text. Deacons or women can be deacons, Romans 16 and verse 1. But that's not what the word means. The word means a servant. And there are lots of ways that we can serve. True or false, women can be servants of the church, of the Lord. Absolutely. Phoebe was a servant of the kingdom, of the church. That doesn't mean that she was a servant in the sense of the deacon that we think of, a specialized servant that has requirements, has qualifications uh, similar to that of an elder. There are several things that must be true, one of them being a man. You must be a male in order to be a servant in that sense of the word deacon. And so that's one example. The next one there, letter B, apostle. Apostle is translated, from, or transliterated rather, excuse me, from the word apostolos. That's, that's all it is. It's just a transliteration. It's another one of those words that's not really a word. It's just transliterated from the Greek. However, what does apostle or apostolos, what does that mean? What is the translation of that word? Anybody know? I think it means special servant or something. Okay, on the right track. 
It's, it's also uh, would be the, the definition of the term for angel as well. An angel is better translated a what? Messenger. That's the word we're looking for. Messenger. The translation is a messenger. In fact, again, doctrinal issues arise from not understanding that this word is a transliteration. Look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 14. We haven't got to this part in class yet, and I won't say anything else in, you know, in this text other than verse 14 just to make this point. Somebody read verse 14 out loud and tell me something that kind of seems odd to you in that passage. Acts 14, 14, anybody that's willing. Excellent. What stands out as a bit odd there in that passage? Really? Sorry? Really well, okay, that's true. That does too. But as far as, think about, as far as the apostle part of this, yes. Kevin, Barnabas, according to this passage, true or false, in the King James Version of the Bible, when you read this, Barnabas is called an apostle. Yes. Absolutely. Was Barnabas an apostolos? Well, okay, I see what you're saying. He wasn't one of the 12 or 14, right? He wasn't one of those special, but he was a messenger. Yes, uh, I didn't ask that question very well. He was a messenger, but he wasn't an apostle in the sense that we use it. He, he was an apostolos, but what does that mean? It means a messenger. That's what he was. He was a messenger of God. The word angel, especially, and I'll just quickly mention this. In Revelation, do you notice how it says the angel of the church at Laodicea, right? Okay, it's not that Laodicea had a guardian angel. It's the messenger. This is a person, a man, a messenger who's reading this letter that was written. And so it helps to clarify when we understand the difference between a transliteration and a translation. And there are lots of other words that we could use. But here's the point. Baptism is transliterated from baptizo. Okay, baptizo. That's a transliteration. What does it actually mean? What is its translation? That's it. Submerge or immerse. That's exactly what it is. Dip is another word. The word bapto uh, means to dip. All of those the same idea. Dip, submerge, uh, immerse. That's it. That's the translation. Why do you think, anybody who knows a little bit about history probably knows the answer to this. Why do you think that King James thought it would be wise not to translate that word, but to transliterate it instead? Or it's not King James, but rather those who are uh, translating it for him or during this time period, what was very, very popular that was going on? Sprinkling. That's it, sprinkling. King James himself involved in this. And so what's going to happen if these translators decide to say it's got to be immersion and nothing else is... If they translate that immerse, what might happen to them? That's it. Excommunicated. That's exactly right. They're going, there's going to be severe punishment for that. Many of them might have even lost their lives over it. So what are they going to do? Well, let's just transliterate it. You can't go wrong there. And then we can just you know, open it up to interpretation. The translation of the word is to immerse. And if that's what the Bible said in all of those places, we wouldn't have these, be having these debates and arguments uh, about this subject, at least in my opinion. Maybe we still would. Sometimes people just try to get around it anyways. But Luke 16 and verse 21 is an example of, of the word. The word there, the form of it is bapto. But it's in reference to uh, the rich man. You remember how he wanted uh, Abraham or, to send Lazarus? to dip the tip of his finger in water. That's the word there, to dip. Interestingly, they translated it there. They did not transliterate it. Why did they do that? Because it's not about salvation. So they decided to translate the word. Well, guess what? It was to dip. And so it's just that simple. But I say it's simple. There's just a lot of people that don't know that without someone showing them that or without really digging deep and studying the word. All of a sudden you realize there's a few places they did translate that word. Uh, there's another passage, I've forgotten where it is, where they talk about dipping uh, bread into water. That, that's the, uh, it's translated there as, as well. And so you get the idea. Any questions about that before we move on? We understand the difference between a transliteration and a translation. All right, very good. A letter D there. For centuries, immersion was the only mode of baptism. Okay, the first century, second century, that's all they did was immerse. It wasn't until really Augustine, until it sprinkling became popular, there was something called clinical baptism, which in fact history tells us that uh, Constantine 
practice this. And basically, what they would do is, is wait till the very last minute, till they were on their deathbed, and then have somebody baptize them. Well, they, they weren't in proper health to be immersed, and they may not have time to get there, and so they would just sprinkle water. Constantine did this. That was clinical baptism, if you've ever heard of that. But really, it wasn't until uh, Augustine in the 4th century A.D. that this really became popular. And so it did, uh, though, uh, happen to be the case. They did not, letter uh, one or I there, uh, they did not uh, sprinkle, or excuse me, yeah, sprinkle the water or pour it. That was not the practice in, until several centuries after Christ died. Just like mu instrumental music or anything else, these things came in by men later down the path as these divisions began to spread and these schisms, these different beliefs. Let's look at some of the proof text that people use to argue that baptism is, uh, it's fine to have uh, sprinkling or pouring when it comes to baptism, that these modes are acceptable. Oh, I don't want to skip this. I didn't have this on my sheet and I forgot about it. Let me give you a few, just real quickly, this is not on your sheet. Uh, let me give you a few uh, quotes from uh, men, very popular men, who are well into these particular denominations, just to show you that even in many of these denominations, they believe for the longest time that uh, baptism was by immersion. And the same with instruments. You've heard lessons probably like that, that most of these denominations didn't have instruments uh, to begin with, or they understood that historically they didn't. Here, for example, uh, Bishop Lightfoot, very popular uh, in the commentary series in Episcopalian, Baptism is the grave of the old man and the birth of the new. As he sinks beneath the baptismal waters, the believer buries there all his corrupt affections and past sins. As he emerges thence, he rises uh, regenerate, quickened to new hopes and new life. This baptism is an image of his participation both in the death and resurrection of Christ. All right, this picture of dying and burying and coming back up, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Which type of, or form or mode of baptism would that suggest? He seems to be inferring there that, that uh, baptism is by immersion. Some of these are maybe even more clear. Alluding, this is Adam Clark, a very uh, renowned Methodist commentary. I use his commentaries often. Very good uh, material. You've got to filter through it. It's not all going to be accurate, but some great thoughts. Alluding to the immersion practiced in the case of adults, wherein the person uh, appeared to be buried under the water as Christ was buried in the heart of the earth, his rising again the third day and their emerging from the water was an emblem of the resurrection of the body. The immersion there he references. John Wesley, another well-known name amongst the Methodists. We're buried with him, alluding to the ancient manner of baptism by what? Amen. Baptizing by immersion. Wesley himself said. Lutherans, uh, Mosham here. The uh, sacrament of baptism was administered in the century, the first, without the public assemblies, in places anointed and prepared for that purpose, and was performed by an immersion of the whole body in the baptismal font. Another Lutheran, uh, Tholuck, for the ex uh, explanation of this figurative description of the baptismal rite, it is necessary to call attention to the well-known circumstance that in the early days of the church, persons, when baptized, were first plunged below and then raised above the water. These are, they're all recognizing in the first century, this is how it was practiced. Uh, Catholic here, Brenner, for uh, 1,300 years was baptism and immersion of the person underwater. Right? It, was, it began in the 4th century, but it, it wasn't necessarily widespread and popular uh, at that time. But that's where it all started, history tells us. All right, let's go to these proof texts, as I mentioned. Leviticus 4, we'll go back to our sheet now. Leviticus chapter 4. Now, as we read this, we're reading... Now, keep in mind, the Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. If you read an article I, I did a few weeks ago about the Old Testament canon, one of the, the, the proofs that we have for the fact that these 39 books are accurate in the original canon is because they're the only 39 books written in this original Hebrew language that God had them uh, prescribe or to write by inspiration. And so, this is written in Hebrew. However, you recall that when Alexander the Great came through and began to uh, Hellenize all of these uh, countries, all of these nations, and Greek became uh, such, everybody's learning Greek, becoming Greek. What did they do with the Hebrew Scriptures when they could no longer read the Hebrew, many of them? They translated it. They translated it into what's called the Greek what? Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint. Now I'm going to make reference to that uh, as we, after we read this and show you why I just said all that. Look at verse uh, number, uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I want you to notice three key words. 
And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all of the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar, or the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay, now these, these first texts we're looking at are proof text that baptism should be by immersion. Okay, and then we're going to look at their arguments, their proof text that they believe says otherwise. But Leviticus 4, in the Greek, you see that first blank there, the Greek Septuagint, we see all three words used here. What I mean by that is, I love this, in these two verses, the only place I found it, all three Greek words, the word for immersion, the word for sprinkling, and the Greek word for pouring are all used. They had, in other words, they had these Greek terms. If they wanted to mention pouring, there's a word for that. If they wanted to mention sprinkling, there's a word for that. I always remember that one, rantizo, because it's so much like baptizo. I never can remember the pouring word. I'm not a Greek scholar, not even close. Uh, but there are unique words for each of these. Now, I put this up here. I don't normally give you the verses, but that's why I read it first, because I want to underline a few of these key words. You notice the word dip, the word sprinkle, and the word pour. Take a guess at what the word is for that word dip. That's it. It's bapto. That's it. That's the word. And guess what? They translated it here in Leviticus, of course, to dip. And so, really, the, what separates this text for me is that all three words are used, and it's three different words. They could have used rantizo, or the word for poor, if they wanted to suggest a different mode for baptism. Right? And so, there it is. Leviticus 4, 6, and 7 uh, in the Greek Septuagint. That's a, that's a far and deep uh, argument there, but I, I just think that's significant because all three of those words are used. Let's go to the New Testament, though. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Let's go over there. We'll spend the rest of our time in the New Testament. There are several passages, I believe, that give some strong evidence that baptism was always by immersion in the New Testament. Several of them. Some of them are stronger than others, but I'm going to give you uh, the ones I believe to be the most um, evident. Verse 36. Philip, as you recall, joins himself to the chariot with the eunuch. Okay, verse 36. As, this is Acts 8. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Okay, that, that underlined. The eunuch came to some water. What is that, why does that word came have significance? What does this suggest? Sorry? Yeah, they had to go to it. You think they came across a cup of water? What does it mean by came? They came to a body of water, right, didn't they? They came into a body of water. Well, what happens there in verse number 38? They went where? Down into the water, right? Someone says, well, that doesn't mean he immersed them. Well, the word down doesn't mean immersed there. But what it does mean is they both went into the water. You can't debate that. What, why would they go into the water if all you had to do was sprinkle or pour? You really think they're going to go in there and get all wet? And get their clothes wet, Miss Sylvia? If they're going to sprinkle, they're going to carry water around in a little jug. <laughs> You're exactly right. Why not? Get a little, uh, little piece of pottery there and hold some water. And Philip could have had it ready, couldn't he? And, just, and then been on his way. Would have saved him a lot of time, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, but that's not what happened. Uh, they went down into the water. That's significant. They both went down, the blank there, into the water. And so why would they need to get in the water, uh, the next part there, unless they were practicing immersion? All right, let's go to Mark chapter 1 and look at the next one. And stop me, I'm going to just go, you know, kind of bang, 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 as I normally do with these passages. But stop me if you have a thought or question, and it won't bother me a bit. We'll pause and, and talk about it. Here's another one, Mark 1 and verse 5. Someone read that one for us, uh, if you're willing. Very good. They were baptized where? In. in the Jordan River. In it. Right? Again, why is that necessary? Why get everybody's clothes wet? Right? You say, well, don't, I just don't know that that's the, the greatest evidence. Well, maybe some of these last few will be even stronger, especially one of my favorites, John 3 and verse 23. Let's jump there now. John 3 and verse 23. Someone read that one. And that, that blank there was just I in. I in. In the Jordan River. John 3 and verse 23. The next one. Simon, 
Muslims because there was much water up there and they came and they were baptized. Outstanding. What is the key word in this passage? Much. How do you get around that, brethren? He baptized there because there was much water. Friends, I don't know about you, but you don't need much water to sprinkle or pour. Right? You just don't need it. But you need much water to immerse. That might be one of the strongest verses, I, at least I found, uh, to prove uh, this uh, text, or, or excuse me, this, uh, this argument. There is much, much water there. Yes, sir. This is another example of, of your example about the King James Version uh, trying to placate the, the Catholic Church. But one of the, one of the religions, uh, religious movies, I can't remember which one it was, was showing the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. Right. And John and Jesus were standing in the water, and John reached down, got a handful of water, put it in Poured it on his head. Yep. They were trying to placate. That's it. Don't want immersion. That's it, and that's what's in the minds of, of people. Again, do you think even you know today it would be the same as then? Would you, if you knew all you had to do was pour water in your head, would you want to go down into a river to get baptized? Why would you do? Why would you go get all wet? That just doesn't. But you're exactly right. I've seen that. Seen that as well. Somebody had a hand up. Yes, ma'am. Miss Corley. And, and the verse 22 in that chapter. Yes, ma'am. Uh, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. The, the baptizing there is by the he. Who is the he? In verse 22. John, yeah. What did you say, Kevin? The disciples baptized. Right, Jesus never baptized, right. The disciples did. In particular, we're talking about John here. Uh, there he tarried with them and baptized. And, you know, I could see an argument there for the he being Jesus, but... Yeah. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't believe Jesus, I don't think we have any evidence that Jesus ever baptized um, anybody. But that's, a, I can see where, let me read it one more time. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Yeah, yeah, I could see how it could be, I, I don't think that's saying that Jesus baptized. But I get, you know, if you read it, uh, when you read that straight through like that, it does seem to, to act like it's referencing Jesus baptizing, but uh, I just don't think that's the case. Um, who, there a passage that says that he baptized no one saved as a apostle. Jesus? Yeah. Not, I can't, now, now keep in mind, just because I don't know of it doesn't mean it's not there, but it, it doesn't ring a bell. Yeah. We know one person who said he never baptized. Who was that? Paul. Yeah. Paul never baptized, but... Yeah, Jesus, the only baptism Jesus gave was the baptism. And if there is a reference, that's probably what it is, because he baptized the apostles with the Spirit. And that was a miraculous. They received the baptism of the Spirit, which was a promise that only they uh, were able to receive. And so, um, and then the Gentiles did as well uh, in Acts 10. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, I, I can't think of where that verse is, but even if it's there, that's probably what it's referencing. But I don't know that there's a, there's a proof uh, text to show that Jesus baptized um, but verse 22 would be the closest thing to hinting at it. You're, that's a good question. I've never noticed that before, the way that's worded there. But um, that might be something to look up a little more. Anybody else have any thoughts on that, Gil? Yes. Right. A lot of times, in, in my experience, it's both. You know, I have... Uh, some, uh, some nieces-in-law that, that recently went through this, and it was basically it was both of those things. They did it uh, to, to uh, make sure that their sins were gone, and they did it to dedicate them uh, to start there. So it's, it's really the two go hand in hand in their mind, from what I understand. Um, but just, just off of what the mother said about those kids, she was exactly dedicating them to God and making sure that their sins were forgiven is literally how she worded it. So I would say both. And some of you that may have more experience in Catholicism may... I have a better answer for that, but uh, I know a few of you have said you've had a background with that. Yes, sir. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard 
that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. There you go. I thought there was a verse that said that, but I was afraid to say it and embarrass myself. John 4 and verse 2. There you go. That, that, that helps. Uh, Miss Corley there. John 4 and verse 2. Very good. So the, you were not the only one that had that question. In fact, the Pharisees uh, uh, were hearing that and believed that to be the case, but it wasn't. Very good. Thank you, Jinky. That's why I love Bible study time with the discussions and we learn from each other. And John 4 and verse 2. I'll never forget that. And I just want to say one thing before you go to the next section. Yes. Just to show how ridiculous it is. I think, you know, when Larry was talking about how, you know, when this movie depicted Jesus going down in the water and then just picking up some water and pouring over his head. If water being distributed over our head constitutes the will of God that would bring about salvation, then there's, not virtually, there's virtually not a person on the planet who's not been baptized because we all have been caught in rain. You know, I mean, if it's just a matter of water being on your head. <laughs> you, you, you well, know? surely they would argue that the intention would have to be there you know, because yeah. everybody's been swimming. Yeah, you know. but, 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 but I mean, but I mean the, the, the force of the logic is, is not much more. Yeah, because, well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's um, you, you know, what authority do you see for that in the first place? So I would yeah. say the person who's get caught in the rain is just about as saved as a person who'd have water poured over their head. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the logic uh, uh, is difficult to, to, put in, to put in with that. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Romans 6 and verse 4. Good, good thoughts and, and great questions. And good answers uh, from you all. Thank you very much. Romans 6 and verse 4. We know these, this passage. Baptism is a blank and a resurrection. What's the word there? It's a burial. It's a burial and a resurrection. Right? And as, I, as I've said before, have you ever seen, and this is on your sheet, have you ever seen someone buried by sprinkling or pouring dirt on the body? Could you imagine somebody being buried and just sprinkling some dirt? Right? No, nobody would do that. And yet, baptism is a burial. What does that mean? It means to be submerged. We die and are buried just as Christ was. Right? One of the uh, uh, religious uh, guys we quoted earlier made this statement, and it's from Matthew 12 and verse 40. He's exactly right. He was in the wood of the earth. Jesus, when He died, was in the wood of the earth when they buried Him. The heart. He was in the heart of the earth. I mean, what does that mean? Does, that, d does the heart of something sound like he was on top of it with just a little dirt on him? No, he was in, it, submerged in it. He was in the middle of it is the picture there, the heart of it. Um, very much so he was buried. And that's what baptism is. It is symbolic in that burial and that resurrection. And frankly, if we're poured upon or sprinkled upon, we haven't been buried with Christ. We haven't been raised with Christ. Right? How would you mimic that action? When you pour water in your head, are you going to, you know, I'm not going to go into the water, but I'm going to dip myself to the surface of the water. I'm standing in the river, and that just doesn't even make sense. You're going to be submerged in it and come back up out of it, of course. All right, let's look at these arguments that uh, often arise. We've got just a few minutes left. Numbers 8 and verse 7. They sprinkled in the Old Testament. True or false, God used sprinkling in the Old Testament as a form of purification. True, absolutely. Numbers 8 and verse 7, that's, that's uh, one of the examples. Uh, and thus shalt you do unto them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water to cleanse them. Uh, sprinkle the water purifying upon them. Let them shave their flesh, wash their clothes, and make themselves clean. I would answer with verses like Numbers 19, 19. They also had to be what in water to be clean? Not only sprinkled, but they had to be... Yeah, they had to be washed is the word there in Numbers 19, 19. They had to be washed in it too. I mean, th there were several things involved in this process. Are we going to go to, th to the way that they purified themselves from uncleanness to talk about how to be saved by the blood of Jesus today? Of course not. Hence the argument there, the next part of the, the worksheet, this argument is justification coming from the old law. And so even if that was the case, even if God did use sprinkling in the Old Testament as part of salvation, it still isn't going to bring us justification to do that today. And if it does... We've got to go back to Galatians 5 and verse 4. Ye who are justified by the old law, you're fallen from what? Grace. From grace. You cannot serve both testaments. You're committing sin, spiritual adultery on Christ. Um, the Spirit is poured out. Zechariah 12 and verse 10, as well as Joel 2, 28 and 29, 
you see references to the fact that God pours the Spirit over those who are His. How would you respond to that? Does that give proof that baptism can be done by pouring? I know you don't think so, so why not? How would we respond to that? The Spirit is poured out. And that, of course, occurred in the New Testament. That was a prophecy of what would happen in the New Testament. Yeah, it's not talking about the, the baptism unto salvation. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Which I think are two different things. Exactly. That's the key. He's talking about not baptism to salvation, just as Carlos said. He's talking about pouring out the Spirit. They are two different things. Things. And that's the next blank, in fact, Carlos. You nailed it. Receiving the Holy Spirit and baptism are different acts. They're different acts. In fact, uh, for time's sake, Acts 2 and verse 17 is a great example. But Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, let's turn to this one and just a, a great proof text to see the difference. Someone read verses 5 and 6 for us of Titus chapter 3. Very good. Just as the prophecy said, He would pour out the Spirit abundantly. Now, is the pouring out of the Spirit, is that what you do in order to be saved? Or is that something that happens after you become saved? After. You don't receive the Spirit in that sense until after you're baptized. When you come up, when you're resurrected out of that water, then you're a child of God. Then the Spirit is poured out in that sense upon you, and you have uh, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. We've talked about that a few lessons ago and, and what that indwelling really means and so we won't do that again but that's the idea these are two different things and again uh, the pouring of the Holy Spirit we need to see evidence that baptism into Christ for the remission of our sins can be done any other way other than immersion and those arguments are just not there I'm moving quickly because I really want to get to this last one this is the most popular argument I've personally uh, been given multiple occasions and maybe you as well let's go to first Peter 1 I'd really like for everybody to turn here with me. 1 Peter chapter 1. I think in answering this argument, we might really uh, learn uh, something uh, really incredible about this concept of what sprinkling really means in the New Testament, if we don't know that already. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, notice, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead." That passage, true or false, references the saving blood of Jesus in the form of sprinkling it. Absolutely, it does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does. We've got we, just a couple minutes. That's all I need. Referencing the blood of Jesus as sprinkling. Now, right off the bat, first of all, what do you notice right before it mentions the sprinkling? Obedience. Notice there's a separation, a distinction between two entities, obedience and sprinkling. I want you to hold on to that as we answer this question. I wanted to, to kind of get your thoughts, but I, I need to, uh, uh, to, to finish this up, and so I'm just going to tell you if you don't mind. Hebrews chapter 10 is a great passage to bring clarity to this argument. Hebrews chapter 10. And honestly, you probably would have said this anyways because you guys are always right on point. Hebrews 10, begin reading in verse 19 with me. We're, we're focusing on this idea of sprinkling. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, referencing uh, the tabernacle, the temple, the holiest, the most holy place, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. He died on the cross. We get to enter the most holy place, spiritually speaking. Verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, notice it, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our what? Sprinkled. Our hearts sprinkled, don't miss this, from an evil conscience, and our bodies what? Washed with pure water. Amen. 
obedience and sprinkling. And then what do you see here? Baptism or washing of the body and sprinkling of the heart, which of course the biblical heart is the what? The mind. Or the other word used here is the conscience. Sprinkling is the blank here. It's symbolic in the New Testament when used of salvation just as the term washing is. But notice they're separated from one another. The sprinkling is not the baptism or the obedience. It has to do with the heart. The body is washed and the heart is sprinkled. The next blank. Now think about 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Stay with me. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. This is the, the verse about baptism saves us. Do you ever notice that reference to the conscience in the passage? The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting of the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good what? Conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Question. Baptism is an action or a response to a good conscience. What then would the good conscience represent in God's plan of salvation, do you think? At what point is your conscience beginning to be clear before baptism? Repentance. Repentance. I think so. I absolutely believe so. Baptism is the response, the answer of that good conscience. And so there's, there, all these verses, we're putting them together. There's obedience, and then there's this concept of sprinkling of the heart or the conscience. What's involved with the heart or the conscience in God's plan of salvation? Repentance. Is that not a conscience, a mental decision to change my life? Let me give you another one. What about Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14? How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9.14, the blood of Jesus purges your what? Conscience, your heart. From dead works, your life is changed. Those dead works are gone. To actually being able to serve with good works the living God. And so the heart or conscience, number two there, is pure before baptism. The blood, and by the way, by the way, if you really think about Romans 6, what kind of person do you bury? A dead person. Think about that for a moment. In what sense have you already died? When you repent. That's it. You bury a dead person. And so when Romans 6 talks about that you're, you're baptizing the dead, you don't baptize somebody that hasn't repented just like, therefore, you don't baptize somebody that hasn't died. You can't bury them while they're living. They have to die, and then they come a new creature. And so there's a mental decision before baptism. And I would submit to you that that is what sprinkling is referencing. God is using that concept of sprinkling from the Old Testament to identify with the purity of heart, that is, with repentance. And so the blood of Christ purges our conscience, number three, and then finally, in short... Sprinkling is closer to representing blank than it is baptism. Repentance. Repentance. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions or thoughts on that, though, catch me afterwards and we will talk about it more. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here and your kind attention. And uh, we hope you'll stick around a few more moments as we have a, a song and uh, invitation and closing prayer.